Yeah, all right. I'm hesitant to give you a passage because actually, um, as you remember last week at the beginning of the week, I gave, sent out emails to you and I gave you a whole lot of passages to look at. Basically, they were parallel passages with respect to Jesus being abandoned and with respect to his being arrested. So I'm going to be talking to you from a number of those passages and uh, try to draw together some common themes from them. And one of the things that I want you to, to gather from this, and perhaps maybe if I were just to have a, a sharing time right here and now, you might say to me, uh, you know, Pastor, in, in reading those passages, this is what I got out of this. Uh, one of the things was that I saw that I'm not the only person that feels abandoned. There were times, you know, in your lives, uh, perhaps when a husband or a wife uh, left and uh, the one left behind felt truly abandoned and without hope. Perhaps as a child, your parents divorced and you felt abandoned by one or the other of the parents that were, were yours that you assumed would be there for life. And then all of a sudden they were not there. And you felt like, how am I to handle this? Where am I to go? What am I to do? Perhaps in the reading of this passage, or these passages, you felt that Jesus understands you. That Jesus himself had been abandoned on many different occasions. Those that perhaps ought to have supported him and encouraged him did not. Especially in times of really incredibly deep need, he was left to himself. I'm going to talk to you about some that perhaps you would not have understood as those who abandoned Jesus. You would be surprised that I would include them in a list of people who did such a thing. But I hope you'll understand after I explain them to you that, yeah, yeah, they fit in that list too. Like, for instance, the religious leaders. The religious leaders abandoned Jesus. Now, wait a minute, you might say, they were never on his side. I mean, they were continually harassing him. They were following him place after place and plotting to kill him. Uh, how is it that they abandoned him? If they had abandoned anything, he would have been happy. For what they were doing was the wrong thing. But no, listen to me. These were men who were commissioned by God to be the religious leaders of the people. Of the people. He was, they were the leaders of the flock. And they were to be on Jesus' side. Here he was, the son, coming home to earth. And, well, as the scriptures say, um, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. Especially those religious leaders. So they abandoned him early. They investigated him and uh, decided that he was not on their agenda. And therefore, he was not who he said he was. He was not to be... Uh, supported or encouraged and so they abandoned him early and then they spent the rest of his ministry ridiculing him and looking for every possible way they could uh, they could pull him down in the sight of the people they had no use for him Jesus told a parable that goes like this uh, the kingdom of heaven is like a king preparing that prepared a wedding banquet for his son he sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. And then he said, send some more servants and said, tell those who have been invited that I've prepared my dinner, my oxen, fattened cattle have all been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field and another to his business. The rest seized his servants and mistreated them and killed them. The king was enraged and he sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. You see, they abandoned him early on, but that wasn't the end of it. They wanted to see him dead and they wanted to destroy what he was trying to build. A remnant, however, quietly believed that he was the Messiah there was a small group that believed, but they kept it quiet to themselves. So, abandoned is a word that you can use 
for the religious leaders. You could also use it for the Jewish people. The Jewish people had been recipients of miracles. Not many of us have had miracles happen in our lives. That's a wonderful thing when it does happen. I consider my wife's healing to be a miracle. I know how it happened. I know who actually was used to do it. But I still think of it as a miracle that God revealed at the last moment just exactly where that tumor was. And just in the nick of time, that to me was a miracle. And I am incredibly grateful. Well, these people had seen those kinds of things too, and actually some of them had experienced them. They had seen all of his signs, and those were signs that impeccably pointed to the fact that he was different from anyone else. In fact, the Holy Spirit who worked those miracles through him was telling the people, this is the Son of God. Well, they'd received his teachings too, and nobody had taught like him. He wasn't like the scribes or the uh, teachers of the law. He didn't quote other people. He just simply said, this is the way it is. And his, his voice was with the voice of authority. And people understood that he had the authority that he claimed. They witnessed his love as he reached out to people who were covered with leprosy. And he touched them. And how he put his fingers in the ears of the man who was deaf. And how he touched little children, picked them up and held them in his lap. Jesus had shown his love in many ways. They had also felt his rebukes. And everybody knows that if you're truly loved and people care about you, they'll tell you when things are not right. He had welcomed them as their, they had welcomed him as their king during the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. You would have thought that, man, it's a shoe-in. Jesus has indeed become the son of God and become the king in their eyes. And the people are receiving him as the Messiah. This is good. It's moving in a good direction. But... When the priests primed them to say so, they said, crucify him, crucify him. And then they called for his blood to be put upon their heads and on the heads of their children as well. Hmm. Jesus once spoke at the time when John the Baptist's disciples came to him asking, for John, whether he was indeed the Messiah that he claimed to be, because John was getting extremely encouraged, discouraged, rather, in prison. And Jesus looked upon the people who were kind of looking at this, uh, this opportunity for scandal. I mean, they were thinking, Jesus, <laughs> you're, you're the man who, who went around saying, this is the Messiah, pointing to you. Now he's wondering. You know, what's going on here? And then Jesus said, let me talk to you about you. He first talked to them about John, and he just praised John up and down. And he said such encouraging words about John because his ministry had indeed been effective, and it was just what God had intended to be. And then he turned to the people and said, you know, you guys are looking down your nose at John, and you're thinking, well, I guess he's kind of tanked. And Jesus, you know, he's no longer being touted as the, as the Messiah by John. What's going on here? Jesus, let me talk about you. And he said, to what can I compare the people of this generation? What are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace, calling out to each other, well, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not cry. Jesus said, I'm saying this because John the Baptist came neither eating or breathing eating bread nor drinking wine. And you said he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking. And him, you said, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. There's no pleasing you. You are a fickle crowd. And you will turn in any direction, depending on who's leading you and what your whims are at any particular time. And so the people abandoned Jesus. Another perhaps a surprising one. How about the thief on the cross? The thief on the cross. Now, wait a minute. Uh, you're talking about the one that asked Jesus to be saved? Yeah, I'm talking about that one. But at the beginning of his 
being hung there with Jesus. He abandoned Jesus. Now, what would you say brought them together? Well, people who suffer the same thing together, you sort of assume that, you know, there is a certain bond. You know, we're all hanging here on a cross. And uh, so, you know, we're kind of, you know, connected. And, uh, but that wasn't really the case at the beginning. Both of those thieves hurled insults at Jesus. Didn't you not think that strange? I mean, they're suffering the same thing as he is. They're all dying together. They're connected really in a very important way. And they're hurling insults at him like, you know what, you're the Messiah, get us down from here. You know, playing upon this bond, this imagined bond that they might have with each other. Do something for us, we're suffering with you. But then later on, as this one particular thief began observing what was going on and observing how Jesus responded, and as he was thinking, you know, they were there for hours. And he saw, first of all, them saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And he saw Jesus give his mother to John, putting her into his care. The thief began to reevaluate what he had done, and then he began to say something totally different. Two robbers were crucified, one on the one's right and one on the left. And those passing by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You were going to destroy the temple and build it in three days? Save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross. And we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Well, in the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him also heaped insults. But the other criminal, then it says, rebuked the previous one. Don't you fear God, he said, since you're under the same sentence. We're punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man, he's done nothing wrong. And then he turns to Jesus. Jesus, remember me. When you come into your kingdom, and Jesus answered, I tell you the truth today, you will be with me in paradise. They abandoned Jesus, yet one of them makes a real unwarranted request. I mean, after all, he had also been giving insults to Jesus, but then he had changed his heart. He repented and he said, please, Lord, remember me. I know that I am not worthy. And Jesus received him. That's a hint toward us who may feel ourselves to be abandoned. First, we notice as we look at this different, these different examples that, that Jesus understands, he understands being rejected. He understands being abandoned. And he responds in ways in which maybe we wouldn't. Well, here we go. Here's the 12 disciples. Think about these men for a moment. They had been carefully chosen. Now, they were not carefully chosen by you or I. Because if we were to say that, you know, Howard had carefully chosen these people, you might say, okay, that's, that's something. But what does Howard know about choosing people? What does he know about the people's hearts? What does he know about their futures? I mean, so it's very nice that he did it carefully. But there's no guarantees that if he does it, that anything really good will come of it. But here we have Jesus, who knows the people's hearts, and he knows their futures. He knows exactly what they're going to do. He even told them that there was one amongst them that would betray him. He knew that at the beginning. He chose these men. So it's kind of hard to imagine why is it in the world that they abandoned him? Couldn't he have chosen better men? They had heard teaching that others had never heard. 
They had seen miracles that most had never seen, you know, when the three were taken in, when the others were left outside. They saw the, the, the daughter of the, the, uh, the Jairus raised from the dead. They had seen his miracles and saw more than anybody else had seen. Some of them saw them, one here and maybe one there, when they happened to be where he was when he did one. But they were always with him, and they always saw, or most of them saw, most of the miracles that he did. And they had been given personal training by Jesus. I think that probably if you were a, uh, <clears throat> a sergeant uh, in the Marines, you probably could have done a better job in getting people to fight for you at the end, right? Uh, but Jesus didn't do that. He trained them just the way he wanted. And yet, they abandoned him. They abandoned him. What did he do wrong? He chose these very men. And then he trained them personally. And he demonstrated that he was the Son of God. How, how could they possibly doubt him in any way? He had been... They even had been given power to do miracles themselves. I mean, who is it that gives power to others to do miracles? Nobody does that. Only Jesus. And they had been warned of the coming persecution and the death of Jesus. They, he had spoken to them about that. He said it very clearly. They are going to take me and crucify me. Well, so they've been prepared for that. Hmm. They had witnessed Jesus' example. He was the best man that could ever have been. He had hand-picked and then trained. They were trained by the best. So how did they do? Well, one of the disciples made a deal with the high priests to pray to Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Wow, what a failure. I mean, talk about he didn't get it. I mean, talk about having been chosen, talking about being trained by the best, and here it is, he ends up turning Jesus in and betraying him for just 30 pieces of silver. What a colossal failure. He was hardened. He was, here, you know, have you ever thought, you know, I witnessed to this person and he doesn't seem to be responding? In fact, he seems to get harder every time I speak to him. That is is Judas. Jesus was the greatest witnesser that ever walked the face of the earth. He knew how to communicate about God and about himself. But Judas had a wall. And Judas didn't let it penetrate. And Judas got harder and harder and harder. Which, you know, this is some things to learn from this. Sometimes people, when they're really hard, you can't tell. You can't tell they are. They seem to fit the part. They seem to act out the place that they're supposed to be. And you just don't know where they are. They're very deceiving. And that's Judas. Remember when Jesus said, you know, one of you is going to betray me. And you would have expected, wouldn't you, that all the other disciples would have gone <laughs> at Judas. Right? Now we all know who it is. Right? But none of them, every one of them said, Lord, is it, is it I? Is it I? Nobody said, is it Judas? Because I think it's Judas. Nobody said that. So that, that tells us that Judas was very deceiving. And Judas was not treated differently because of Jesus' love for them all. He treated Judas as he treated every one of the disciples so that nobody got a clue or an inkling from Jesus that somehow or another this guy's got something going that's wrong. He still loved him and loved him and warned him. The one who puts his hand into the sop with me, Judas, it's you. Judas, it's you. It's you. Well, he had gotten hardened. Remember we talked about that? How about uh, blaspheming against the Holy Spirit, a sin that would not be forgiven? We'll find in the end that Judas is not forgiven. 
Well, there were nine of the disciples that ran away when Jesus was arrested. Now you do your math. One betrayed him. Nine ran away. That leaves how many? Two. Okay. So these nine ran away. You don't see anything at the end when Jesus has risen about them having to come to Jesus and say they were sorry. Why is that? Why is it that he doesn't come to them and say, you guys ran away? Because he told them to. Do you realize that? He told them to. If you look in John 18, you'll read in verse 4, Jesus knowing what was going to happen to him went out and asked. This is when 200 people with swords and with torches and all were coming to arrest him. Just one man, 200 people to arrest one man. You know they're scared stiff. Jesus, Jesus takes control of the whole scene. He is totally in control of what's going on here. Soon as they arrive, Jesus, knowing what is going to happen, see, he's in control. He knows how it's going to go. Knowing what's going to happen, he went out and asked them. I've always admired people that you know, are aggressive in, in good ways. <clears throat> I've learned some things from playing softball. The aggressive person gets the ball to first base before anybody else does. You know, when you're playing at shortstop or you're playing at second base and somebody hits the ball, if you just stand there and wait for the ball to come to you and then you throw it to first base to get him out, you're generally not going to get it there in time. Well, I saw this one guy. He was good. And as soon as the ball was hit and he saw the direction, I'm just still seeing that it was hit. He's, he already knows the direction. He knows the speed. He knows where it's going. He's off like a flash. He is running towards the ball. He meets it halfway between home plate and where he was standing. And then he throws the ball while he's running to first base. The guy had no chance whatsoever of getting to first base because he was moving ahead. And that's what Jesus is doing. He knows what's going to happen, so he gets up and he moves forward and he takes charge. Who are you here for? Uh, uh, Jesus of Nazareth. And then everybody falls down He's, when he says, I am he. Get up. Who are you here for? Jesus of Nazareth. Okay, we've established that. You're here for one person, me. Let these men go. See, he's in charge. They're listening to him. They're not asking the questions. He's asking the questions. And he says, let these men go. What do you suppose his desire was? For the men to go. Wouldn't you say? So he's telling them to leave. Well, when they write the story, they say, and then they all deserted Jesus. Because that's how they felt about it. But they were doing what they were told. Leave. Think about this. Jesus didn't want anybody to rescue him. When Peter pulls out his sword and he hacks off the high priest's servant's ear, Jesus says, Peter, I don't need you to rescue me. I got 12 legions of angels standing by. I could just call them. I don't want you to rescue me. I want you to get out of here. You see, I need you after I'm risen from the dead. You're no good to me fighting these 200 people and getting killed in the process. It'll make a nice story in the end and everybody will praise you for your, your valor and dying together in battle. But that is not what Jesus' plan was. He had trained these people for three years not to watch them die beside him. So they were told to leave. Peter? Well, Peter kind of tags along. He still, you know, he didn't want to just go home. He's feeling really bad. He's feeling really bad because, you know, Jesus said, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter 
Peter's got to prove to Jesus that he is loyal. And so Peter is out there. He's, he's swinging the sword. I don't know what he was thinking, except that maybe, you know, because he obviously wasn't thinking that I will take on these 200 people by myself. That's what I'm going to do. Either it was simply impulse. You know, he didn't know what he's doing. He's done that before. Or maybe he was thinking that if he took a swing, that maybe Jesus then would engage. And then fire would come out. And people would die. And the Romans would be just thrown to the ground. I don't know. But Peter clearly wasn't listening to Jesus. Peter had his own agenda. I am going to prove that I'm loyal to Jesus by doing this. It's sort of like a husband trying to prove to his wife that he loves her by giving her a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> we need a vacuum cleaner, right? That's what he'll say afterwards when they're all fighting over the fact that she didn't like what he gave her. But you see, sometimes we're like that, where we say, I want to prove what I want to prove. I don't care what he wants. It's what I want that matters. And that's what Peter was doing. This is what I want. I want to be known as somebody who is loyal to Jesus. So I'm going to swing a sword. And I hope that he backs me up. Or otherwise we're all going down. So he tags along behind. If he had just gone home, or he had just gone to the upper room with the other disciples. Do you suppose he would have denied Jesus three times? He wouldn't have had the opportunity. See, Jesus knew what Peter was like. And he knew he would tag along. And that he knew that he would end up there and he would be denying him. Peter was totally confused by what happened after he swung the sword. Somehow or another, it just didn't come off the way he thought it would. And he was totally discouraged. And he was wondering, what is going on here? I just, I try to do my best. And it just doesn't seem to, to come out right. So and then he's, he's dejected and he's, and he can't, he's, he, he was unable to do anything for Jesus. And now he's kind of tagging along behind a whipped puppy. And, and he is in no condition to take on a, even a girl at the gate who says to him, you are one of his disciples. I don't know. I don't know. So when did the disciples abandon Jesus? They weren't abandoning him when they went home that night. They abandoned him earlier. What was it that Jesus wanted from them? Stay here and pray with me. He says, my soul is in agony unto death. You want to do something for me? I know some of you are planning to, you know, to defend me, to die with me. Guys, I don't need you to do that. What I need right now is for you to pray with me. Will you pray with me for one hour? Oh, my you mean you didn't want the vacuum cleaner? You'd much rather have flowers? I don't want your actions of valor. I need your oneness with me. Jesus had taught them about the Father and the Son and how they were going to be one with him. And it is a spiritual it is a spiritual relationship that drives people together in prayer. What would Jesus want for our body of believers here? About, you know, I could give a really good, you ought to be at prayer meeting right about now. But I think what God wants more than that is that we become a praying people. That we pray together wherever. It doesn't have to happen on Wednesday nights. But we should be a praying people. One with God. 
I really don't need you just to fill pews, Jesus would say. I really, I need you to be one with me. Pray. Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. That's where the disciples abandoned Jesus. <clears throat> so, how did they do? John, I think, did well. John followed with Jesus. He went to the trial. He was there at the crucifixion. He took Jesus' mother to take care of her when Jesus gave her to him. John should have been there. It was, I believe, the Lord's will for him to be there with Jesus. So, how did Jesus respond to that after the resurrection? <clears throat> I think some of them felt that, you know, I, <laughs> I don't know how to look at him in the eye anymore. If he were to rise from the dead, I don't know. I think that's Peter all over, isn't it? Peter, I denied that I even knew him. I said I would die with him. I said I would die with him more than anybody of the other disciples. I, I'm better than them. I will definitely die with him. And I just told people I didn't even know him. He was weeping. He was sorrowful. He had a burden the size of a Mack truck all over his shoulders. And he was weeping. Now when Jesus rose from the dead, one of the first people that Peter, that Jesus found by himself was Peter. And I don't know about you, but I would have loved to have been there. Wouldn't you have loved to have been there? There's nothing like the relief of a burden taken away. I can see Jesus standing before Peter. Peter's on his face before him, crying, oh, Jesus, I can't believe you're here. I, 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 I'm, just, I'm unclean. Remember, he said that once before. They get off my boat, I'm unclean. I'm an unclean man with unclean lips. Jesus is raising it, his hands and, and inviting Peter. Ah, Peter says, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm just so sorry. Peter, I forgive you. Do you remember the day when you understood you were forgiven? When Jesus' blood was applied to your life, do you remember the relief oh, that I will not stand before God as a guilty man? It's good to be reminded of these things. Remember, look back to the pit from which you were dug and Rehearse that again. And then P Jesus takes Peter in front of the other disciples. And that was kind of a difficult thing. Peter, do you, rem you love me more than these? <sighs> I don't know. And Peter didn't like that one very much. Or do you know I love you? Do you really love me? Yes, I really love you. Do you really even care about me? Oh, Lord, you know that I love you. Then feed my sheep. Guys, you listening? Feed my sheep. He is your leader. He is restored. He is one with us again. Don't ever look down on him. Don't ever bring this up to him again. Because you see, he's one with us. He has been washed clean. And I've accepted him back. <laughs> what would you do? If you were face to face with somebody who abandoned you, maybe it was your dad, maybe it was your husband, your wife, would you be like Jesus? Would you forgive? It would be hard. It may take time. But that's what he asks. No, no, no. He doesn't ask. He demands. He demands. If you want to be forgiven, you must forgive. Clear as a day, clear as the nose in the face. 
is clear. We have abandoned him, haven't we? We have been forgiven of such great a debt. So who are we to withhold it from others? Let's pray together once again. There may be somebody here today that has never felt the release of sins forgiven totally, completely, forever forgiven. Maybe you've been working hard and somehow or another trying to become good enough somehow or another trying to fit in and enjoying all the fellowship and enjoying you know the talking about God and enjoying the uh, the people who love him but somehow or another this has never been your experience you don't know whether you're forgiven or not you can you can know today I invite you to to pray to admit to the Lord that you have sinned and you've sinned many times as everybody else has. And that you're willing to turn from those sins because you want to live a different kind of life, a life that is in harmony with that which God desires for you. So tell him that. Tell him that you are asking him for forgiveness based on Jesus shed blood that Jesus paid the price and he's inviting you to come as a free gift he wants to just wipe the slate clean and just bring that to the Lord and say would you do that for me would you take me would you make me yours Jesus said anyone who comes to me I will in no wise cast out Father, thank you that you work this miracle of salvation in people's lives. It's not something that the pastor does. It is something that your Holy Spirit does. And if anybody is moved to, to pray to you today for their salvation, it'll be because, it will be because you have given them life and faith and you have given them the ability to come. Please grant this to them, Father, I pray. Help us, Lord, that do know you, then to be like you. To be those who forgive others, even when we've been abandoned in many ways, too. Thank you, Father. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.